Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. We rise up and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Studying the word of God makes you strong. And if you want to receive the strength, you must receive the word. Digest the word, assimilate the word, apply the word to your life. You want to pray that God will prepare your heart. That as you listen to the word of God tonight, it will enrich you, stabilize you. Plant your feet on the solid rock so that the winds that blow, the trials that come, the temptations that assail your life will not be able to push you down. Talk to the Lord in prayer that tonight, everything you learn about the Almighty God, the ancient of days, Lord God Almighty, the Most High, that what you learn about Him, understanding is your Father, your Creator, your Redeemer, the one that loves you so much to send His only begotten Son, to die for you on the cross of Calvary. As we learn about him, the ancient of days, and the almighty God, the most high tonight, your faith will be strengthened. And then you'll be able to stand whatever betides or befalls all the people. Pray that the Holy Spirit will take everything you hear, implant it, inject it, infuse it into your heart, into your spirit, into your soul. Then you become firm in your faith in the Lord, faithful to the Lord, knowing whom you believe. Pray that the strength that comes with the word, the power that comes with the word, will so work mightily, effectually in you. It will be more than a conqueror in all the situations and circumstances of life. Pray you'll be awake. You're not sleep as the Lord reveals his mind and shows himself unto us. And pray you'll not just be learners, you'll become teachers of the word yourself. As you receive the word, all the people will receive the word through you. Your good attitude to the word will be reproduced, multiplied in the lives of all the people who are listening to this glorious word through you. And through the word, enlightening you empowering you, influencing you, transforming your life. Now through this word, you become a standing, stable, steadfast believer and a courageous teacher of the word, leading other people into this faith once delivered unto the saints. Pray that as you come week after week, taking in, soaking in the word of God, Letting it sink deep into your heart. Your neighbors, your fellow brothers and sisters will see 
the impact of the word, the influence of the word, the power of the word in your life. And the beauty of holiness that this word produces in you will draw many, many other people to the Lord. Pray that your obedience to the word produced by God's infinite grace will lead you to such a life of doing good doing what pleases the Lord every time that your life will be profitable to the kingdom and your life will be rewardable The Lord has done it for other people. He can do it for you and through you as well. This is what brings us in close contact, fellowship and relationship with the Almighty God. That's the Word of God. Pray that the benefit reserved in the Word will be yours. They will flow through to others through your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us together tonight for this wonderful study of your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you have said for us. And thank you for what we are learning so simply like this when you took all the people deep and great experiences to learn. And yet to have preserved this for us. We pray, Lord, we'll show gratitude unto you for what you've given to us in Jesus' name. And we pray that this word that you have preserved for us through the ages, many people have suffered and lost their lives because of the preservation of the word. And now it's been given to us. We pray, Lord, we'll ever be grateful unto you in Jesus' name. Now, as we come to study, we're praying, O oh Lord, that the benefit of the study you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. All our brothers and sisters, all our children, boys and girls who are studying with us in all the other locations all over this country, all over the continent of Africa and beyond, O oh Lord, we pray as you are blessing us here, you bless them as well in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You are sitting down now to study the word of God. We're in Daniel chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 34 and 35. Daniel chapter 4. We're looking at verse 34 and 35. What we're looking at today, one, is a testimony. A personal testimony of 
Nebuchadnezzar. What we're looking at today is a great revelation. A revelation that it took seven years for Nebuchadnezzar to be able to discover that revelation. What we're looking at today is an instruction as well. What Nebuchadnezzar had learned in the seven years of experience in his humiliation. The Lord is presenting everything to us tonight and is saying, Here, see what this man has learned. See what he went through before he learned this. And now you don't have to go through all that if you are wise. You can just learn what others have learned. It makes us to see beyond what we would have known. We say it like this. We say, you stand or you sit on the shoulders of those who have gone before you. And then you are able to see far than they could see you see, Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't know God, the true God, the living God, the everlasting God, the eternal God. But he went through a harrowing experience, a, a kind of terrible experience. You know the story already, what you have studied. And out of that terrible experience, then he learned so much about God, a revelation, an instruction. Let's look at it now. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4 verse 34. And at the end of the days, that is at the end of that period, at the end of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Those are the verses of scripture that we're looking at. But you'll see this is a testimony. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted up my eyes. I lifted up my eyes unto heaven. He was looking at Babylon before this experience. When the experience came and then God humiliated him and God chastised him and great punishment came upon him at the end of the day, he said, I wasn't look at Babylon anymore because that is nothing now. All the builders of Babylon, even including myself, all of us, all the inhabitants of the earth, they are reputed as nothing in the sight of the Lord. And now I praise the Most High. He's the God of heaven. I'm not looking at my kingdom anymore. I'm looking at his kingdom. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. I'm not looking at my dominion, all the people I reign over. I'm looking at his dominion. And it is from generation to generation. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4 verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. He wasn't just going to tell the testimony to the people around him. He wasn't going to just share the testimony in his local community. He wasn't going to share the testimony only to the people around in Babylon. He was going to tell all people, all nations, all languages that dwell in all the earth. Can, can we stop for a moment and think about the thousands of testimonies we have the change that god has made in your own life in the life of your family in your business and the change the lord has made in our church altogether if we would add all the testimonies together we can almost say that we'll not be able to finish reading everything in one year. And yet, how, what have we done with those testimonies? You see, in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, if Nebuchadnezzar had, had the privilege of an internet, think about that. If Nebuchadnezzar had, had the privilege of radio, the, the waves that will take all that he wanted to say to everybody in the world. If Nebuchadnezzar had, had the privilege of having television that will just be everything and then they captured the they captured the picture of Nebuchadnezzar when he was in his 
insane insanity and then when he came out of that insanity and he looked up to heaven and he said i praise the name of the almighty god and he called him the most high god if nebuchadnezzar had, had all the things we have today think about what you will do what a challenge to us i believe that when we eventually get to heaven if we fail to get this word out unto all people unto all nations and unto all languages think about that and nebuchadnezzar was not just uh, happy with the chaldean language you know before his experience he was so proud of the chaldean language and all those jews that were captured and he came to babylon he said you must teach them the language of the chaldeans the language of babylon but now he said i'm not even interested in changing the languages of people all i want Want to do is translate this testimony translate this experience of god and then send it to all the people in all the communities in all the cultures and in all the languages of the people think about if nebuchadnezzar were alive today with all the electronic kind of translation he could have and with all the possibilities of just taking one single message Think about this, this just a single experience, and it's just a single dream, and it's just a single fulfillment, and it's just a single event, and then he put everything down, and he multiplied that in all languages, and saying to people, it's a challenge for you, and a challenge for me. We have more than one message recorded down. We have more than one event we have done. We have more than one experience we have captured, and now we take that, and we beam that out out and it says and we're not limiting that to our country here we're not limiting that to just africa and we're not limiting that where we have only churches and where we have a kind of a groups we're, we're putting that all over if we're going to do what nebuchadnezzar did what will it have taken him think about that you know something when you read the word of god and it says unto all people and nations and uh, languages you have to send people pick up people interview people select those people to travel around how could they get to those languages there was no radio how could they get to those nations and there was no television how could they get to all those places there was no internet he had to pick up people and he went when he picked up the people then he said you travel here travel here travel there you wouldn't know as so you just read verse one when he says nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people nations languages you don't know the administration that goes into that it's a challenge length for you and for me that as we hear the word of god and as we learn the word of god and the word of god is available then we make it available to everybody then he said in verse 2 i thought it good to show the signs and the wonders nebuchadnezzar what kind of sign the sign that turned me insane and the sign that made the seven years of calamity and sorrow and suffering to pass over me. Are you happy that you went through such a terrible situation? Well, I'm happy because if that affliction had not come upon me, if that humiliation had not come upon me, I would never know the God of heaven. That experience is a good experience that turned my eyes away from the darkness of idolatry and turned my eyes to the light of the glory of God in heaven. Don't tell me that that insanity was bad. Don't tell me that that chastisement was bad. Don't tell me that the suffering and the humiliation was a bad thing anything that god uses to turn the heart of a man and turn that heart to the almighty god is a good thing you might weep tears those tears are good you might have sorrow that sorrow is good you might have pain that pain is good if that pain if those tears if that suffering if that challenge if that difficulty turns your hearts away and turns you away from idolatry and turns you away from perdition and turns you to paradise and now you can say there is a god in heaven he is my god that's a good good experience that's why nebuchadnezzar said no i'm not unhappy yes i know what i went through and i'm going to tell everybody the change that has now come upon my life i thought it good 
that to show the signs and the wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion. Tell me the rest. From generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar's chastisement and humiliation brought a great revelation. Before the stroke of divine punishment came upon him, he had looked with an heart of pride and self-exaltation on the works of his hand. He looked at this great Babylon. Look at verse 29. It says in verse, uh, in verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? That was his attitude. He was proud. He exalted himself. He was haughty. But then, after that experience, after he suffered the wrath of God for seven years, he looked up to heaven and he blessed the most high. In the past, his flatterers had often complimented and praised him, O king, live forever. But now he became convinced that no king lives here on earth forever except the true and the living God. He declared, The Most High is he that liveth forever. He also received the revelation of God's kingdom and dominion, which is everlasting and from generation to generation. He realized, he recognized the immeasurable greatness of God and the infinitesimal littleness of man. God is almighty and he is the most high while man is nothing. Look at that verse 35 again. And all the inhabitants of the earth, the king and the princes and the captains and the counselors and the cherries and the men and the women and the educators and the scientists and the philosophers and the psychologists, all of them together, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, none, none, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Now he realized that the greatest of men in comparison with the Most High are less than nothing. God is infinitely great. And man is infinitesimally small, so small like an atom, so small like a molecule, so small like a grain of sand. And, and indeed, he is nothing before God. As his understanding returned unto him, he referred to God as he that liveth forever. God is the living God in contradistinction to all the false gods who have no life. He lives forever in contradistinction to all his creatures on earth, all of whom are destined to die. He will still be living when all on earth shall have died. He will live forever in the future as he has lived forever in the past. That is our God. That's what we're looking at today. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the immensity of God. That means the greatness of God. That means it's so large and it's so big, so immense. You cannot really uh, see him through. And then number two, the insignificance significance of man so small so small insignificance of man and then number three the invincibility of god you cannot conquer him you cannot restrain him you cannot limit him and you cannot stop him there is nothing he wants to do that he cannot do he will do everything he wants to do the invincibility of god i come to number one what's number one the immensity of God. Let's look at, um, at Daniel chapter 4. We're looking at verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. 
and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the most high. See what he called God now? He called him the most high. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever. He says this is a God not like the idols of the land. It is a God that will never die. This is a God that lives forever. This is a God who has been alive from the past. He doesn't have any beginning. The first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. The one who had been eternally self-existent from all eternity. And he will continue to live until all eternity. So Nebuchadnezzar said, I praise him and I honor him because he lives forever. Whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. Yeah, you understand that the dominions of the kings of this world, they are changed. They are destroyed and displaced. And those kings are deposed. But it says that this God, nobody replaces him. He does not have successor. He does not have predecessor. God does not have anybody coming before him. He has all been there for more eternity. No predecessor to the Almighty God and no successor. Somebody that will take over from the Almighty God and say, okay God, you've served your term and now you've served your time and that's okay for you. Now get out of the place so that we can succeed you. The successor, no. No predecessor and no successor because the Almighty God, he is always there and will always be there and then here we are told that his kingdom is from generation to generation one generation will come another generation will go and the almighty God still continues is ever there the immensity of God as you look at Jeremiah chapter 23 we're looking at verses 23 and 24 Jeremiah chapter 23 and we're looking at verses 23 and 24 here we're told about God. And this shows us where, how to, how to really understand how great God is. How mighty God is. How infinite God is. He tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 23 and verse 24. I am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. He says, where do you think I'm located? Am I a God? Only a community God, a local God, a country God, a continental God, a God at hand. Only a God here. And not a God, also in verse 23, afar off. Am I not in, the, in all the places at the same time? No man can talk it like that. And no man can say anything like that. It's only God that can talk like that. And he said, Jeremiah, I'm asking you. And you go ask the people, am I a God at hand and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Who can hide himself any place and say, this is a part of the earth where God is, where his eyes do not see things, and where his hand cannot catch, and where his hands cannot touch, and where his influence cannot reach. He's telling us that his influence is everywhere. His power is known everywhere. And his understanding reaches every, every nation, every place. And he says in verse 24, Can any hide himself in secret places that I, I shall not see him? Says the Lord, do not I feel heaven and earth? Says the Lord, my influence feels everywhere. My presence feels everywhere. My power feels everywhere and my knowledge revelation feels everywhere that's the immensity of God the greatness of God the power of God even the heaven of heavens cannot contain him he's so great he's so big that the heavens of heaven cannot contain him think about that and when you have a big house and somebody comes in he only sees maybe in a place at a time. He cannot feel the whole place. When you think of this earth, all the earth, the earth is nothing in size compared to heaven. And in the heaven of heaven, so big and so large. And then the Bible says, even the heaven of heaven, so big and so large, cannot contain God. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 18. Second Chronicles chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 18. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? 
Will God dwell? Can you limit God, restrict God, moderate God, contain God here on the earth? Will God in the very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. The heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. You understand then how great God is. Immense, large, big, mighty, indescribable. We're looking at Psalm 47. Psalm 47. And we think about this, that this is the God who is your father. This is the God who is your redeemer. This is the God who loves you so much and is sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And he says, I want you to live with me. I want to be your father. I want to take care of you. And he's so great, he's so mighty, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. And yet he says he wants to have relationship, father-child relationship with you. What a great thing is this, a great privilege is this, that the God of heaven, the mighty God of heaven, as immense, as great, as big, as everlasting, as eternal, as infinite as he is, he wants to be your father. And he says, what can you give for this? What exchange will you make for this? That you'll just abandon your sin and say, this is a great privilege. Let me ask you, if a rich man, the richest man in your country, the richest man in your community, if he just came to you and he said, I, I want to be your father and I want to take care of you and I want to take care of every need in your life and you've read about him, you know about him and People have sung about him. People have written about him. And he's so great and he's so mighty. And now he comes to you and he says, I want to be your father. I want to take care of you. What a great privilege that will be. Then he says, only one condition. Live where you are and come unto me. You hurry up and pack all your load and live where you are. And then you come to him. And now the God of heaven is greater than any man. Greater than any king. And greater than any emperor on earth. He comes to you and he says, I want to be your father. All you need to do is vacate where you are. Live where you are. Abandon where you are. That is, live all your sin. And then come in repentance and come to the Lord. And he says, now, once you do that, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'll save you. Take all your sins away. And then I become your father. What a great privilege. That man will be a fool to reject such a great privilege. That woman will be a grateful, the greatest fool on earth to reject such a privilege village our god is great and this great god is our father he'll be your father in uh, in psalm 47 i'm reading from verse 2 for the lord most high is terrible he is, he is a great king over all the earth. As we read about this, always remember we're talking about God. It's not just a God that is far away and is aloof over there. We cannot even touch him or relate with him. It's a God who has covenanted to become our father. And he says this God is the most high and is terrible. Terrible against the enemy and terrible against the pagans and the heathen. He is a great king over all the earth. In verse 7 it says, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God seated upon the throne of his holiness. As you think about that, he's inviting, he says, hey, why is he describing himself to you? He's describing himself so that you'll see what you miss when you are not with God. And you'll see what you gain, what you have, what you possess when you come to the Lord. You'll see what you lose when you backslide and you go away from this great God. What sorrow, what disappointment and what suffering you are going to have if you forsake such a God like this. But if you stay with this God, the God of all the uh, the king of all the earth the one that has dominion from everlasting to everlasting and from generation to generation if you stay with such a god what a great benefit is yours what a great inheritance is yours in verse 9 the princes of the people are gathered together even the people of the god of abraham for the shields of the earth 
belong unto God. Think about that. That all the protection you can have in the world, everything is controlled by Heavenly Father, by this great God of heaven and earth. He is greatly exalted. We're looking at Psalm 83. In Psalm 83, I'm reading from verse 18. Psalm 83, verse 18. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. That men may know. Do you remember what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that this will come upon you. This tree will be cut down. And then seven seas will pass over the tree. Telling Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the man. You are that tree. You'll be deposed, you'll be dethroned, you'll be sent away from your throne, and you will eat grass like animal, and the dew of heaven will come all over you, and then you, your fingernails will grow like the claws of the beast of the animal, and then the air of your hair will grow like the feathers of the eagle, until you know that the Most High dwells in heaven, and he liveth forever and ever. And he rules over all kingdoms until you know that. Now think about that. Nebuchadnezzar has to go through those years, seven years of humiliation, seven years away from the throne, seven years of suffering before he could know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. But now you don't have to go through that. See what has happened. That God now has preserved that knowledge for you. And now he puts you so much like on a silver plate and it says Nebuchadnezzar has known it, other people has known it and the reason why this is recorded is so that all, all people may know that this God is the most high and the reason why you came to the Bible study tonight is so that you will know, just sitting down just listening to the word of God and receiving it in your heart that now you say, I know, I know what Nebuchadnezzar knew and I don't have to go through all those sorrowful experiences of Nebuchadnezzar before I know that verse 18, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. We're looking at Psalm 92 verse 5. Psalm 92 we're reading from verse 5. O Lord how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. O Lord, how great are thy works. And it says, thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. That's what gave confidence to the psalmist. Remember David? He faced giants. He faced difficulties. He faced problems. He faced Goliath. He faced Saul. He faced what other people had never faced. What kept, on go what kept him going on? What made him to keep on standing? What made him to be steadfast? What made him to be able to say, you come to me with the shield and with the sword, and you come to me in the name of your idol, but I come unto you in the name of the Lord Most High of the God of heaven, whom you have defied, is because he knew that God is a great God. He knew the immensity of God. He knew the greatness of God. That's what gave him boldness. That's why he said, I will run through a troop. That's why he said, I will tread upon the heads of my enemies. That's why he said, I will enter into his pavilion. He will hide me in his pavilion. He knew the greatness of God. You know, the people that try, they come to worship and they go to church and they do this and that. And a little problem comes and then they are panicking and they are trembling and they are afraid. As if, how will I face this? They don't know how great the Heavenly Father is. They don't know how great their Redeemer 
redeemer is they don't know how great the power the immensity of the power the might of the of the almighty god they do not know that it is that's the reason we're studying so that when you know how great your god is then you'll have confidence you'll be able to say i know who my god is i know his power i know his strength i know his might and i know the possibilities that i have in him because i belong unto him in verse 8 but thou lord art most high forever forevermore we're looking at psalm 145 psalm 145 verse 13 145 verse 13 thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and you see if you look at the title of that that's the psalm of david david psalm of praise david knew this many many years before how did he know that god revealed it unto him he didn't have to go through suffering humiliation being deposed, being dethroned. You know, there are many ways of learning a lesson. You can learn a lesson in a very simple way. Sit down, hear it, accept it, assimilate it, digest it, think it over, and apply it to your life and say, Praise the Lord, I've got that knowledge. Other people, they wait until they're dethroned. They wait until they are cut down. They wait until they are chastised. They wait until a calamity comes upon them. And now they learn what they could have learned sitting down. And as we learn this today, I pray to sink deep into our hearts. That we will know like David knew. Like we will know like eventually this man, the Kadnizah knew. The Lord, the, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion endureth throughout all all generations and we're looking at uh, psalm 90 verse 2 psalm 90 we're looking at verse 2 in psalm 90 verse 2 and we'll see what the lord is preserving for us here before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting thou art god this God is great. And I pray that you'll know him by personal experience in Jesus' name. God is referred to as the Most High. You find that all over Daniel. The supremacy of the Most High God includes his omnipotence. That means his all powerful is omnipresence that means there's nothing you can hide from him because he's everywhere present at the same time and it's omniscience and that means that he knows all things the full revelation of the attributes of god makes us know that he is the first and the last he changes not he shall endure even when the earth and the heavens have all passed away now you see Nebuchadnezzar in his newly received revelation and personal conviction. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God is the God of heaven. Come back to Daniel chapter 4 and see the last verse in chapter 4 and see what he said about this God. He says, now, he said, I'm not the same person I used to be. I'm not as ignorant as I used to be. And I'm not as wicked as I used to be. A conversion has taken place. A transformation has taken place. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the God of heaven. The God of heaven. Whose all, whose works are truth. And all his ways, judgment. You see, he knew now the divine sovereignty of the Almighty God. That he rules over all of heaven and all of earth. He had a clear recognition of the righteousness of God's dealings with him. He praised God as the king. And he says, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. He had learned and known that God is the one who truthfully observing all that takes place on earth and above all possibility of deception applies a just and equal test to every man's conduct and appoints for him what is right. Nebuchadnezzar magnified the power of God. God and commended the justice of God. Listen to this. His humiliation and affliction became his schoolmaster and taught him eternally valuable lessons which neither prophets nor angels could teach him. 
If a prophet had come to him and had said, we're going to have a class today. We're going to have a Bible study today, Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to talk about the greatness of God, the power of God, the might of God, the immensity of God. Even Daniel could have taught him that. He wouldn't learn. An angel could have come from heaven to teach him that. He wouldn't learn it until suffering, chastisement, punishment, humiliation became his schoolmaster. And when he came out of that school, he said, I've learned my lesson. Now I know who God is. He is the most high. He is the mighty one. He is the king of heaven. And his kingdom is everlasting. His dominion from generation to generation. I pray we'll learn the same lesson. We come to point number two now. The insignificance of man. Hey, there's something that Nebuchadnezzar realized. He learned another lesson. He had learned his lesson about God. Now he learns a lesson about man. He used, he was thinking before that man was great. In fact, he felt was greater than the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's why he told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said, I hear that you are not worshipping my idol. Now, if you will hear the sound of the music, and then you fall down to worship, well, but if ye worship not, ye shall they cast the same hour into the midst of a burning furry furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? In the days of his pride, of his haughtiness, of his ignorance, that's what he thought. He thought was greater than God. That what he decides to do, to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo into the fire. Where is the God that will deliver you out of my hand? He thought he was all in all. He thought man was a great, great personality. He thought man had a decision and could do anything that he wanted to do. And not even the God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed in could change or turn that around. He thought that his decision was final and his project was final. His program was final. And whatever he wanted to do, he thought it was all in all. But now he had learned a lesson. What lesson did he learn? He, not, he learned that man is nothing. In the sight of the Almighty God, he learns that man is lighter than vanity. Look at it in um, Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, the first part. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Nebuchadnezzar had an extraordinary discovery of the nothingness of mankind. Not just of the nothingness of one man, not just the nothingness of Nicodemusa, but all the inhabitants of the earth. He says they are nothing. That means he discovered the nothingness of the whole of mankind. I want you to look at um, Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, we're reading verse 15. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15. Nebuchadnezzar, you don't need to go through all this harrowing experience, sorrowful experience, a terrible experience of being deposed and going into the forest and then going through all that kind of thing before you learn this lesson. If you had just turned to Isaiah, you would have learned that long, long ago. And the lessons we need to learn in our lives, many times, we don't need to go through this terrible experience of suffering before we learn all these lessons. If we just turn to the Word of God, the lessons are there already. But many people, they wait until that kind of terrible experience of Nebuchadnezzar comes upon them before they learn the lesson that they ought to learn. Now Isaiah chapter 40, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. What does that mean? The nations, all the nations together, they are as a drop of a bucket. You know, if you draw water from the, from the well, you take a bucket to the well, you dip it inside, and then you bring it out. As you bring that bucket out, you find some drops of water dropping off. 
from the side of that bucket. You don't worry about that because they are inconsiderable. They are inconsiderable. That's what he's saying. He's saying the nations are like drops of water like that falling from the bucket. Or turn it around, another illustration. You, you take water in a bucket and then you pour that water into a drum and when you've done that there are some drops that remain there and then when you are put the bucket somewhere the drops fall off and it says that's how small how insignificant men and nations are in verse in verse 15 and it, behold the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. What does that mean? You know, there are times you might hang your clothes outside. You wash the clothes and then the wind is blowing and then you have some, uh, some stains of dust on that shirt. You cannot even see the dust because it's just invisible, insignificant and it says like those invisible stains or drops or grains of sand upon a dress that to hang outside that's how the inhabitants of the world are they're nothing in comparison with the almighty God uh, you understand sometimes if you have flown in an aeroplane while you're still on the ground and you look out through the window it appears that those men are big and, and those cars and all those houses are very big and then the aeroplane takes off and goes up and up and then it goes up so much but at the time you look down, the men that look very big, now they're very small. They're like a little, little hands insignificant. And you're saying that is how men are. Nebuchadnezzar, you could have learned that long time ago without going through that kind of experience. You know what the Lord is telling us? Don't wait. Until the rod of chastisement comes upon you before you learn what you should learn. Yeah, but you know, if you don't learn it easy, you learn it the hard way. Because if God wants to teach you a lesson, he'll teach you no matter how long it takes. It might take seven years, but you'll learn it. But then that's not the best way to learn. Why don't you take the easy way and just go back to Isaiah and go back to the Psalms and go back to the apostles and learn the word of God and understand that this is the pre this is preset for you in the word that you will learn. Look at verse 15 again. Behold, in the latter part, he takes up the isles as a very little sin. The isles, the islands, he takes them as a very little sin in verse 17. And all the nations before him as nothing. Nebuchadnezzar, did you hear that? All the nations before him are as nothing. And then Nebuchadnezzar waited seven years before he realized that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Then it says in that verse 17, And they are counted to him less than nothing. And vanity. We're looking at verse 22 of that same chapter. Verse 22 It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Verse 23 That bringeth the princes to nothing. He brought Nebuchadnezzar to nothing and now Nebuchadnezzar comes Confess that all the inhabitants of the earth, the kings and the princes included, there is nothing. He bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. And let's come to Psalm 34, 39. Psalm 39, we're reading from verse 4. Psalm 39, reading from verse 4. Lord, make me to know mine end. Oh Lord, don't pass me through the experience of Nebuchadnezzar. Just teach me. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to listen. Show me your word. Show me the chapter and the verse. I'll believe it. I'll accept it. I'll meditate on it. And I will live by it. I don't want to go through Nebuchadnezzar's experience before I learn what I need to learn. Make me to know mine end and the measure of my days. What it is that I may know know how frail I am. Behold, that was made my days as an hand breath, and mine age is as nothing. Thank you, Lord, for teaching me that mine age, my stature, my ability, my skill, my possession is as nothing before thee. 
Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. There's nothing to be proud of. Every man at his best state is lighter than vanity altogether vanity. Verse 11, when thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity like he did for Nebuchadnezzar, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Psalm 144, Psalm 144, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 144, we're looking at verses 3 and 4. Lord, what is man? That thou takest knowledge of him. Or the son of man, that thou makest account of him. Man is like to vanity. You see all these men of God, they learned the lesson. That's why they were humble in the sight of God. That's what, whatever their accomplishment, they need was nothing. Whatever their possession, they knew that was nothing. Whatever their brain, whatever their skill, whatever their experience, they knew other people have come before them. As much as they were, as skillful as they were, as effective as they were, as rich as they were. But then they said, where is the man now? The man is gone. Doors be thus returned unto doors, and now we see that the worms of the earth are feeding on them, even though those men were great. That's what we thought at their own time. What it says, because of that, that's why we're humble, that's why we're lowly, that's why we know there is nothing to be proud of. That's why it says over here in verse 4 man is like to vanity, it's this as a shadow that passes away. And we're looking at Psalm 62, verse 9. Psalm 62, we're reading from verse 9. 62, verse 9. It says, surely, men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie to be laid in the balance. They are altogether lighter than vanity. All together they are lighter than vanity. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar eventually learned and that's what we're learning. And I pray you'll learn it. You'll never forget it in Jesus' name. As you may place as many zeros as you like together and they all make nothing. Zero plus zero times zero minus zero plus zero uh, up to whatever power. Everything is still zero. And that's what men are. It says they are vanity. It says they are nothing. And then if you put everything together without God, without the grace of God, without the revelation of God, without the knowledge of God, and without the help of God, all is vanity. And they all make nothing. So you may add up as many men with all their supposed force and wisdom as you please. And they are all nothing in comparison with God. Each man in himself is less than nothing and vanity. A worm is nothing compared to an eagle. And then we know that a lion or an elephant, an animal, is nothing compared to a man. Continue the comparison. A man is nothing compared to the Almighty God. What a shadow to the substance. What's a candle to the sun? What is a drop of water to the ocean? What is a grain of sand to the globe of earth? What is a finite being, however exalted, to the infinite? What is man, a worm, a speck of dust, a clod of, of clay, to the eternal one? What is created? What is a created dependent being to the uncreated independent Lord of the whole universe? We are all as nothing without God. We are nothing in ourselves. Look at the testimony of scripture. We're looking at Job chapter 7 verse 17. Job chapter 7. We're looking at verse 17. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him? And that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. That question is uh, uh, related to God himself. Oh God, what is man that you even think about man? And what is man that you are setting your heart on him? But the question is now thrown to you. Sometimes you are thinking about a man. 
And because of thinking about that man, he's so big in your sight, bigger than your God. And you think, if that man doesn't help me, where will I get any help? And you put your heart on a man. And the word of God is asking you now, what is man? That thou shouldest magnify him. You magnify the skills of people, the ability of people, the importance of people, the skills that people have, and you magnify the experience that people have. And you think, I'll never be able to make it in life if this man does not support me. And the Lord is saying, what is man that thou shouldest magnify him? And that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. You remove your heart away from God and you're thinking about the man. Only this man, only this man. If he does not support me, I'm lost. Then you're totally lost because you don't have God. Uh, when you think of the nothingness of man, all that will not be important to you anymore. Now you're about yourself, you're about yourself. Sometimes you feel big and you feel so great that it brings proud in your pride into your heart. And you need to know that you are nothing. You are vanity in the sight of the Almighty God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Romans chapter 12, we're looking at verse 3, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't be like a Nebuchadnezzar. Thinking that you are the all in all. Thinking that you are the king of the whole universe. Thinking that this is surrounding here, this vicinity here, this community here. I control everything. Hey, somebody was there before you came. And those people, maybe they are no more there now. Where are they? The world is still going on. And the world is still moving on, and the air is not lessened, and the sun, the rays of the sun is not lessened because so and so is gone, and because so and so is dead. Don't think too much of yourself. Don't get into that same seat or platform of Nebuchadnezzar. Don't allow the Almighty God to deal with you until then it reduces you to nothing, and then you say, and I so and so now praise and extol the most high God. God, and now I know all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing in the sight of God. It says over here, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, everyone in the church, because it's writing to the church, the believers, and it says, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We're looking at Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Galatians chapter 6. What he did from verse 3. Here's what the Lord is saying. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. He says, you'll not, you'll not deceive God. If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, that will not deceive God. You will not be able to deceive any of the angels of God. You will not be able to deceive the saints of God, the people of God. You will not be able to deceive those who know their Bible. Those who know that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing before him. And you know, sometimes there are times you're talking to somebody and you say, Why did you do that to me without me? You almost will not be able to breathe because I'm the all in all. And that fellow will feel so small and feel, well, I'm lost, I'm undone. This man, if this man does not continue to give me the help that he wanted to give me, then what am I going to do? It's because you don't believe in God. If you believe in God, you understand that man is another Nebuchadnezzar. And then God will preserve your life even without him in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes you want to make restitution. And then maybe you are wrongly married and you say, you are packing your load and say, I'm leaving. I want to go to heaven because it's a wrong marriage. And then the man will say, ah, you will suffer in life. You want to make restitution? Okay, pack your load and go. You will come and kneel down here and beg because I'm the only one on earth. I'm your God. If you pack out of this place, you, you say you are making a situation, you will suffer. Once I am not in your life, there is nothing good that will ever come. That fellow will realize that Nebuchadnezzar later that God is greater than man. I said God is greater than man. Don't allow any man to intimidate you. And they say, we'll give you this, we'll offer you this, we'll provide this for you. If you will bend down on us and make us your God. 
they are thinking they are so great, but show them how small they are. You'll keep alive even without them in Jesus' name. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I'm looking at First Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to read the second part of verse 6. First Corinthians chapter 4, the second part of verse 6. That she might learn in us not to think of men above that which is reaching. That she will learn, learn it. Don't exalt any man, however rich, however mighty, however experienced, whatever they promise, whatever possession, prosperity they have, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is reaching. That's why it says in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 22. Isaiah chapter 2. What do you mean from verse 22? It says, cease from man. Cease ye from man. Remove your mind from that man. Remove your mind from that woman. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. For wherein is he to be accounted of when God deals with him. Look up here, brothers and sisters. You remember Nebuchadnezzar? The king, king of kings, that's what he thought about himself, and is the, is the protector of all and the provider for all. And he thought, I am king and nobody else. If I am not here, Babylon will not remain. Look at this great Babylon that are built by the might of my power. Listen to this, those seven years that Nebuchadnezzar was not on the throne. Did everybody die? Did hunger kill them? Were they protected? Yes, God was still on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar was not there. For all those seven years, he was in the forest. And the dew of heaven coming upon him. And then eating grass like oxen, like animal. And yet the people were still alive. Don't let any man tell you. They are all in all. They are there. Nobody else there. If they are not there, nothing will move on. If God is still on the throne and God is still on the throne, everything will keep on moving on. I said everything will keep on moving on. Cease ye from man. And don't put all your trust, all your confidence on man. In fact, we are told in Psalm 104. Psalm 104. I'm reading from verse 29. Psalm 104. I'm reading from verse 29. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die. And return to their dust. That's how swift it is. And as a quick it comes, thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. But start at one, the glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. And then in verse 32, he looketh on the earth and he trembleth, and he touches the hills and the smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. And then it says, I will be glad in the Lord. We're looking at Psalm 146. Psalm 146. I'm reading verses 3 and 4. Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4. Put not your trust in princes. They are there today. They are not there tomorrow. If you're going to reach the place God wants to, you to reach, put your confidence in God. And put your faith in God. It's God that is living forever. Men do not live forever. Men will disappoint, but the disappointment is nothing. But God, who is the all in all, who lives forever, if he is your father, you'll get to where you will get to. Give me a good amen. amen. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no hell. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and in, the very, in that very day his thoughts perish. 
in that very day his thoughts perish you know there's times that people will they, they, they kind of tease you they taunt you they torture you and they torture you with promises i will do this for you i will do this for you i will do this for you they never do anything and then you shift all your focus away from god and all the other people around who are willing to help you even you abandon them and you don't want to look at anybody this every time the person sees you have a great vision I'm, I'm thinking of something great 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 and mighty i'm thinking about i'm going to do for you every time they see you they lift up your face and they lift up your uh, lift up your confidence in them and your trust in them and you even forget to pray you don't pray anymore because you know brothers so and so mr so and so promised me that that thing i'm looking i should just just relax and relax. Nothing, nothing to worry about. Everything is my hand. You'll see what I'm going to do. And eventually it says, you, you take it, their breath, go it forth, he return it to his son. In that very day, his thoughts, his promises, and his vision, and all those things he said, everything perishes and they are buried within. Why don't you put your faith in God who is alive? Why are you putting your faith, your trust, your confidence in a man? We don't know whether the man will still be there tomorrow. Put your trust in God. And his thoughts and his ways and his vision and what he has for you will remain because God, this God, is an everlasting God. He will never die. I said he will never die. But man will die that's why only in him and through him do we have any value recognized by heaven saved and favored and surrounded by omniscient omnipotent omnipresent god he makes something valuable out of our nothingness as he created the vast worlds out of nothing now we come to point number three the invincibility of god the invincibility of god you cannot conquer him you cannot change him you cannot hinder him you cannot uh, you cannot uh, limit him we're looking at daniel chapter 4 verse 35 daniel chapter 4 we're looking at verse 35 and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou what a revelation Nebuchadnezzar had of the true God as we look at everything that Nebuchadnezzar said in this chapter after he came out of his humiliating experience of insanity. And we look at everything he saw and everything he learned through this cool master of suffering and humiliation. Let us summarize them. Number one, he said, the most high liveth forever. The most high liveth forever. If you could learn that in the day of prosperity, in the night of adversity, in the night when persecutors are pursuing you and they are bragging, they are going to destroy you. If you can just learn this one single lesson, the most high liveth forever. And then number two, he also learned that his dominion is an everlasting dominion. That nobody can get out of that dominion. That you say, I don't want to be under the control of the almighty God. Everything is controlled by him. Number three, he doeth according to his, his will in the army of heaven. He doeth according to his will. Angel Gabriel cannot say, God, no, that will not happen. And the angels cannot form a committee together, an ad hoc committee, and say, Gabriel, Michael, and all the other angels come on here. We're, in, we're so many. We're innumerable. And we're going to resist this one. No! They cannot do that. And even Satan cannot stand in the way and say, God, I don't permit this. I don't allow this because we're told Nebuchadnezzar learns the lesson. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. Number four, and among the inhabitants of the earth. Among the inhabitants of the earth. No matter the economy of this world, what God also do, he will do. And no matter if all people forsake you, and if all people say, we don't like him, we hate him, we don't want him. If you're a child of God, and you're standing upon the promises of God, I'm telling you, every place you need to get to, you will get there. 
and the promises the Lord has made to you, those promises are yes and amen, and they're going to be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And you know, sometimes you're making progress and you're moving from this level to this level to that level, and it's according to the promise of God, according to the covenant you have, that the Lord has with you. And then some people will say, look at this man. And look at this woman. Look at this lady. It's just moving on and on. Now, if we don't stop him, he will become greater than our children. He will become greater than our village people. And even if they all come together and they say they are going to stop you, can we stop God? God is unconquerable. And God is unstoppable. And the Lord has said he will do his will. And that will he wants to do and accomplish in your life, he will do and accomplish it in Jesus' name. Number five, Nebuchadnezzar lands, and we're learning today that none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Nobody can make a God afraid. Not even Satan, not even the demons, and not even the angels, and not any man. And if you're a child of this King of Kings, or a child of this Lord of Lords, I'm telling you, you take every fear, every timidity out of your heart, because nobody can stop your God. Number six, he is the King of Heaven. Number seven, all his works are truth, and all his judgments, all his ways, judgment. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, and those that walk in pride, is able to to do what? To abase. Our God is great. And this God is your God. If you are born again, he is your father. If you are born again, he is your protector. If you are born again, he is your provider. And what he decides is going to do for you, he will do for you and nobody can stop him in Jesus' name. We're looking at Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. We're looking at it from verse 13. Job 23 verse 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. What a lesson, what an understanding, what a revelation. That God is of one mind. And once he says, this is what I'm going to accomplish, that's exactly what he accomplishes. And then it says, what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. We're told in verse 14, for he performeth the sin that is appointed for me. God has some appointment for you. I said, God's appointment for you. And Job said, that which he appointed for me, he will perform it. He was just in chapter 23. He has not gone to chapter 42 yet. But he knew. He said, everything will be over. All this suffering will be over. All this your sickness will be over. All this your calamity will be over. All the loss that you have sustained, everything will be over. And the tears will be wiped away. Because there is an appointment and not even Satan can hinder that thing that the Lord has appointed for me. He appointed that thing, the thing that's appointed for me. And many such things are with him. We're looking at Job chapter 9, reading from verse 4. Job chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength who has hardened himself against him and has prospered when god says let my son go that they may stop me pharaoh said who is that i don't know that god i will not let the children of israel go he hardened his heart and he said, that thing God wants to do, I'm not going to allow him to do it. The promise he made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, that the children, their descendants will leave this land and they will go to their own land, the land flowing with milk and honey. I am not going to allow it. He hardened himself against the almighty God. Look at that Job chapter 9 verse 4 again. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and has prospered. In the hardness of Pharaoh, did he prosper? The people who try to hinder your progress and they say, no, they are going to be stronger than God. I feel sorry for them. I said I feel sorry for them. Because they have the same experience. Destruction, devastation that um, Pharaoh had. Because what God has planned, nobody can harden himself against the Almighty God and never prosper. Why? Look at verse 5. Which removes the mountains 
and they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. Which shaketh the earth out of her place. And the pillars thereof tremble. Which commandeth the sun and it triceth not. And sealeth the star, sealeth of the stars. Which alone spreadeth out the heavens. And treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Which maketh or Actuals and Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. That wonder will be in your life. And then it says in verse 12, it says, Behold, he taketh away, and who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest Thou. We're looking at Psalm 37, Psalm 33, rather, Psalm 33. We're reading from verse 9, Psalm 33, verse 9. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and he stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. The Lord will bring all the counsel of your enemies to naught. The Lord bringeth all the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. All the devices of the magicians and the astrologers and the wicked people and the sorcerers and the witches against you, everything will be of no effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. The thoughts of his heart to how many generations? As you're listening to this, begin to think you're a child of God, you are born again, you've come, you a kind of abandoned all your sin. You say, Jesus is my savior. What's God thinking about me tonight? What's God planning for me tonight? What promises are, are, are the things in the mind of God for me tonight? What's in the mind of God? Where does He want me to be tomorrow? What does he want me to do tomorrow? What does he want me to accomplish in this single life? He loves me so much. He loves you so much. He's thinking about you. The thoughts of the almighty God concerning you. Look at what it says in verse 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The counsel of the Lord concerning you will stand forever. The thoughts of his heart concerning you will be to all generations. Even though you might be down in the valley of the shadow of death, you are coming up to the mountain top of light in Jesus' name. That's what he has promised. That's what's their purpose. That purpose is going to be fulfilled in your life. In Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalm 115, reading from verse 3. Here it says, But our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. The pleasure of the Lord will be effected in your life. In Psalm 135 verse 6, Psalm 135 verse 6, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth and in the seas and all the deep Places in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 30. Proverbs chapter 21. We're looking at verse 30, 21, 30 of the Proverbs. There is no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. After the Lord has decided something is going to do in your life, there is no committee that can meet in the forest, on the sea, in the shore, under the earth, or in the sky that will negate and nullify and cancel that counsel of the Lord. Whatever God has purposed, that he will do. There is no wisdom. There is no understanding. There is no counsel against the Lord. We're told in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 24. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I live, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. It shall what? Stand. Verse 26. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. The purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. Anywhere you are in, in the world. You are a child of God. Whatever God has purposed, it will come to pass. In verse 27. For the Lord of hosts has purpose and who shall disannul it. 
and his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Nobody. I said nobody. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 13. When God wants to do a wonder in your life, it will be done. Nothing will hinder him. Isaiah 43, I'm reading from verse 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work. God will work in your life. And who shall let it? Who shall hinder it? Nobody. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 10 and 11, declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do. I will do all my pleasure. Can the ravenous bird from calling the ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed ye, tell me the rest, I will also do it. Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah 55, verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. If you are thinking thoughts of death, God is thinking thoughts of life. If you're thinking thoughts of poverty, God is thinking thoughts of prosperity. If you're thinking thoughts of suffering, God is thinking thoughts of gladness and happiness. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not either, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth, and budge, and that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth it shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it the word of God will prosper in your life nothing will hinder the progress and nothing will hinder the promise of the Lord in your life in Jesus name the Lord has a purpose for your life Satan cannot hinder it Babylon cannot hinder it Enemies cannot hinder it. And Nebuchadnezzar realized, he said, don't touch Daniel, don't touch Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are the children of the Most High God. All of us, all the rest of us, were reputed as nothing. Whatever God has purposed for them, God will do. In fact, for the whole generation, from generation to generation, and dominion to dominion, whatever God has purposed, even to this very day, it will be done in your life. Why don't you rise up and talk to the Lord? Now you see the immensity of God and the nothingness of man. You see the greatness of your God, the greatness of your heavenly Father. Trust in that heavenly Father. Believe in that heavenly Father. He's on your side. He'll take care of you. Pray to the Lord. If you're not born again yet, why don't you just call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you. You don't want to miss the privilege of being a child of such an heavenly father. You don't want to miss the privilege of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, turning away from all your sin and having Jesus Christ as your personal savior. So that God will be your father. And so that you'll make all things possible in your life. And you know that nothing can hinder him. Nothing can hinder him. He's such a mighty God. He's such a great God. Look at the personal testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. He published it. He publicized it to all people, to all nations, to all languages. What are you doing with your own testimony? Publicize it. Use all the means available Radio, television, internet, newspaper, printing press, literature, whatever. And send the message across all over the world of who God is. Of the power of God, of the might of God, of the immensity of God. Send the message all over. Let people hear. 
so that people come to put their trust in this mighty God. Use all the knowledge the Lord has given you to publicize the message. Use all the tools available to publicize the message. Use all the technology available to publicize the message. Nebuchadnezzar did, that's why you're reading about it today. Preserve the message. Publicize the message. Let everybody hear, let everybody know. So they can have confidence in this mighty God of heaven. They'll see the infinity of God. They understand the immensity of God. They understand the might of God. They will understand the greatness of God. They will understand the unchanging, unchangeable nature of this great, mighty God. Expand your thoughts about God. Lift up your heart to the God of heaven. Don't look at man as so great, so mighty. As if a man on earth, an enemy on earth, is greater than your God. See how great God is. How mighty God is. A powerful God is the majesty of God, the glory of God, the power of God. See the faithfulness of God and see the promises of God and see that none can hinder him. When he speaks, it's done. When he promises, it's fulfilled. No hindrance against this mighty God. None can say unto him, What doest thou? No witch can hinder him. No sorcerer can hinder him. No, ba- no Babylonian can hinder him. No Chaldean can hinder him. No Nebuchadnezzar can hinder him. The God of heaven, the most high God, powerful, mighty, great, doing wonders. And nobody can harden himself against God and prosper. Anybody that tries to compete with God in your life, threatening you and saying he doesn't care which God you believe in, that is going to do this or that, That fellow is gambling with his life and with his eternity. Believe in God. Trust in God. Depend on God. Put all your faith, all your confidence, all your trust in this mighty God. Do you remember the promises he has given you? They will be fulfilled. Underneath you are the everlasting arms. Nobody can push you down, make you fall. You will not fall, you cannot fail. When the almighty God is supporting you, surrounding you. You can trust in the Lord. And the Lord will see you through any challenge, any difficulty. Learn your lesson. Don't wait like Nebuchadnezzar to go into suffering, calamity, chastisement before you learn the lesson. Learn it now. Isaiah learned it without going through the terrible experience of Nebuchadnezzar. David learned that God is the most high God without going through that kind of calamity. Learn the lesson like those prophets and worthies of old. Learn it as you read it in the word. Accept it, believe it, meditate upon it. And let the lesson you learn be the support of your life. It's great beyond description. It's mighty without any contradiction. 
Remove your mind from men. Don't center your life on so-called enemies. Those are men. All the inhabitants of the earth, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, enemies, Goliath, Philistines, Amalekites, Canaanites, Jebusites, every one of them, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing in the sight of the Lord. Don't fear any enemy. Don't you have God? Don't you believe in God? Stand on these promises that will never fail. Don't let anything shake your confidence in God. And don't say, if that man doesn't help me, I'm lost. If that man doesn't come to my aid, to my rescue, then what am I going to do in life? Remove your mind from man. Lift up your eyes to the hills. From whence cometh your help? My help cometh from the God of heaven. And he will sustain you and supply all your needs. Have faith in God. He never disappoints those who trust in him. Man is insignificant. Like a drop of a bucket. Like the grain of sand. Insignificant. Inconsiderable. God will feed you without their riches. God will support you without their support. If they want to give their support. Because my God shall supply all your needs. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Trust in him. Depend on him. Lean on him. Remove your mind from men. Your confidence from men, your faith from men, your trust from men. Trust in the Lord. Make Him your confidence. He is the Most High. He liveth forever and ever. He ruleth over all. His dominion, his kingdom is from everlasting to everlasting, from generation to generation. He doeth according to his own will. No Satan can hinder him. He doeth according to his own will. What's the will of God for your life? What's the plan of God for your life? What's the purpose of God for your life? He doeth according to his own will. No evil spirit can hinder him. No demons can hinder him. And if you trust in the Lord, no demon, no evil spirit can chase you out of town. He, the almighty God, doeth according to his own will. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. None can stop his hand. None can hinder the oppression of his mighty walking power. None can say unto him, What doest thou? As the king of heaven and earth, all his works are truth. Remember? His word stands and stands forever. Our God is great. Whatever you are going through, the Lord will see you through. No man will be able to hinder you or hinder the plan and the purpose of God in your life. Let your God remain big in your heart. And let all men remain small. You will ride on the storms of life. You ride victoriously. Yours will be the victory and the success. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe in a great God, in Jesus' name we pray. 
If you know that no man can hinder the almighty God in your life, man is small, man is negligible, man is infinitesimally negligible. If you know that, say Amen. If you know the purpose of God in your life will be fulfilled. The plan of God in your life will be fulfilled. Not a minute, not an hour of the span of life the Lord has purposed and determined and appointed for you can ever be caught away by any man. If you believe that, say an amen. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. It is well with me. My God is great. All men are counted as nothing. Why don't you raise your hand? We're going to pray victory prayer, success prayer. A kind of prayer from today. You look at how great your God is, how small those human beings are. You are never afraid of anything in your life in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you because tonight we have learned that our God is great. Our God is mighty. Our God is unconquerable. Our God is the most high. Our God has a dominion from generation to generation. Everlasting kingdom. Our Lord is the God of heaven and the king of earth. He rules over every circumstance on the earth. And now we thank you because we are your children. As nothing can hinder our heavenly father, nothing can hinder us. As nothing can defeat our Heavenly Father, nothing can defeat us. All men, the bragging men, the haughty men, the magical men, the mighty men, the evil men, and the, and the men of secret called the men of evil power, there is nothing in the sight of our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we know, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil. The Almighty God, Emmanuel, is with us. And he sets the table before you, before me, before us, in the presence of our enemies. And none of our enemies can hinder our progress, our success, our prosperity in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that tonight, men will shrink to nothingness in our sight in Jesus' name. And our God will be magnified. And Lord, we pray that no sickness will stand before us. No evil power will stand before us. No poverty will stand before us. No evil power will be able to waylay us in the way and hinder us in Jesus' name. We're going to the mountain top. We're going to the appointed place the Lord has appointed for us. And nothing will stop us in Jesus' name. From today in our personal lives, there's victory. In our family, there's victory. In our marriage, there's victory. In our places of work, there is victory. Anyone that says will not make the progress, we know they are nothing from today. Our God is not big and great, mighty in our hearts. We have no fear for anybody or for anything here on earth. We're going to reach that place in Jesus' name. Your word of power, revelation, and light has come out. And I pray this word will do good in every heart. Magnify yourself in the life of everyone. Lord, we believe and we know all the promises of God are fulfilled from today. Get your people to the land of prosperity and victory and success. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.